Jeff, Mark Bakanek. Uh, I appreciate all of you, Donna Peets. You guys are awesome, man. I appreciate all of you guys for joining me. Um, I was going to do uh, the, the Satanic Ritual Abuse video, but I'm going to save that one. Uh, I'm going to do that here in a day or so. Uh, really, this was just an easier one to put together for tonight. I wanted to get something out there. Um, so, if you guys uh, enjoy the channel, you like what I do, make sure to subscribe. Um, share the links, you know, social media pages, the groups that you belong to. Uh, follow me on social media as well. Uh, and keep in mind we're viewer powered uh, donate and support if you donate and support now I'll go ahead and do it for the month of March um, uh, like I said we'll be doing the satanic ritual abuse video and within the, this week so just whenever I feel like it but this week probably uh, around the first I uh, will be doing that video um, and uh also be talking about packs with the devil and you know stuff like that so we got some cool stuff kind of coming up um you know march might be the last month that i actually do uh this channel though um and it's and i'll tell you why and i'll tell you why and it's not because of you know it i feel like um where I, where, where i started with all this stuff you know years ago things have changed so much um, people have come so far from when I first started doing all of this like seriously people have come so far uh, you know and it's like uh, social media and content creation and, and the nature of all of that has really changed um, so we're going to see how March goes as far as you know if we can get you know support and we can get viewers and, and all of that and if uh, you know if if we can get it going it's like facebook we're, we're growing really good still and all that but like there's you know youtube channel and all that there's just no point in even pursuing this anymore it seems like we don't really get um you know the, the, the you know people don't really need this like they once did you know years ago i feel like so um we're gonna see what we can do for the month of march so uh, if you guys like like this, show up, watch, donate, like, all that good stuff, you know, and I'll keep doing it as long as people keep watching and showing up. Um, but if not, uh, you know, I feel like it's been a pretty good run, uh, you know, and I, I probably will start something different, you know, so, um, and start like fresh, you know, with fresh channels. I feel like right now too, um, with, with the whole like new age shit it's like um people have become spiritual narcissists <laughs> like i hate to say that but it's like uh a lot of the content i like to do doesn't resonate with um you know the base i built when i started all of this so it's like It's like um, I want to kind of cater towards you know what I'm into now instead of like you know feeling like I got to kind of hold myself back you know to do things to to placate people you know or please people it's like we we, we have a, a group of spiritual people now because it's trendy right this whole self-awareness and self-love shit has become it's become trendy and now that it is so trendy it's becoming incredibly watered down you know it's like lost its soul there's no soul in a lot of these communities anymore the spiritual communities are a fucking joke um i watched a lot of these people leave christianity and mormon and whatever you know they were all these different religions uh and they left them left these religions for the very same reasons that i'm wanting to leave this now <laughs> you know, it's like they just brought their bullshit problems over to the truth movement or to spirituality. You know, it's like the same judgmental, hypocritical, pious bullshit. You know, where like everybody's, you know, looking their nose down at somebody for something. You know, I think it's never. You know, and I'm not a teacher. I've never, you know, I don't consider myself a teacher. I'm just a speaker. I, I make content. I love to share content. I love to, 
you know, the stuff that interests me, you know, but, uh, back in the day, it used to be people calling me a false prophet and shit like that, which I felt like that was all right, you know, I kind of expected that from Christianity and shit, you know, but, it, it, and now it's just like, uh, you know, now people call me a, a Satanist and a devil worshiper and shit like that because I'm, I'm no longer, you know, doing the stuff that I was doing fucking six years ago, you know, I feel like it would be a really bad day for any of us if we were the same person five, six years later, you know, that means we have no growth whatsoever, you know, and now we have a lot of this stuff where people have become like this, uh, this new age agenda true where it's, uh, and it really is, it's effective. It's effective and it, and it punches all of us right in the ego is where it gets us. You know, it, it undermines our own arrogance. You know, we think we're too smart to listen to other people anymore. You know, we're too smart to come together in community anymore. You know, we have all the answers. We, we were told to go within, so that means we can never confirm anything outside of ourselves ever again. You know, it's stupid. It's stupid. You know. And we've taken self-love and twisted it and used it as a manipulative... It's a, it's a manipulative tactic now to be a selfish person. Like, that's what it's become. People no longer give... They no longer, not even their time, let alone financially or anything, you know, emotionally, anything. It's like, it's all about, I got to take care of me. And it's like, well, that's, you know, that's what you were doing your whole life is making it all about you. And now you do spirituality, you become a spiritual narcissist to find a new way to make it all about you. Once again, you know. We were supposed to learn and grow and evolve. That way we could help others. That way we could better ourselves to be better service to other people. And I don't know what the fuck happened, you know, with all that. <laughs> and then we were supposed to break dogmas and indoctrinations. That way we could open our mind and expand our horizons. That way we could, we could learn everything, you know. Learn it all. Whatever the truth was, that would be the truth. It wouldn't fucking matter, right? Like, if that's the truth, that's the truth. It doesn't matter if fucking Satan's God. If that's the truth, that's the truth. But that's not what happened, you know? People just created new dogmas now. You know, and anything they don't like to look at before, they would bury their heads in the sand. Well, now they use a new excuse to do that. They say, I'm not going to lower my vibration, or I'm not going to attract that negativity to me. It's just creating new excuses to be the same old piece of shit they've always been and dress it up as being spiritual. And it's it's disingenuous, it's fake, it's fraudulent, and it makes me want to puke in my mouth. You know. And there's like a small handful of people I love, you know, I love some of you guys a lot that have been with me a long time. But that's so very few compared to like you know, the large body, you know, of people, you know, and it's like everybody, everybody regurgitates the same fucking, you know, keywords, trigger words, it's like they don't see the programming and all of it, it's like, what the fuck, <laughs> what has happened here, <laughs> what has happened here? I warned people years ago that we were being indoctrinated into Luciferianism and nobody listened. Well, then you're mad because motherfuckers become Luciferian. It's like, what are you talking about, bro? You were told. This is what was happening. You know? I told everybody years ago we were being desensitized, you know? And being led to the slaughter and it's like, Now they've walked you right into the new world order. You're call you're asking for it now, but you call it ascension now, like a dumbass. You think that's a real, you know, like that's their turn. That's their turn. They fed that to you. You didn't create that. Whew. 
And it's like, is there an original thought amongst any of us? Has anybody ever had a thought that was their own? That is my question. Has anybody ever had enough courage to be genuine and real? Or are we all going to continue to just chase each new trend? You know, and tell ourselves that we're, we're breaking out of the system. And then we use it to, to act like we're so much smarter and judge everybody who's not doing what we're doing. Calling them sheeple and fucking, you know, acting like their lives aren't as valuable and whatever else. It's like, I don't give a fuck about people like that. You know, that's not who I signed up to, to, to kick it with, you know. So, and, 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 you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day too, like, I feel like if we don't say these things, if I don't say this stuff, it's not even being genuine. It's not even being real. Like this has been on my heart for a while. And I feel like I know people can probably tell there's like something missing from my videos. That's it. That's it. That's what's missing. That's what's missing. The passion's gone because I don't have a passionate audience anymore. You know? The passion is gone because I feel like I'm talking to a bunch of fucking frauds. You know what I mean? And not you watching personally. Most of you guys in the chat right now are cool folks. But there'll be way more people to see this after the fact. And I mean, look at my comment section. On a lot of my videos. You know. Everybody waving their finger at me. You know. It's like. Uh, you know. When you're. When you're up and coming. That's what's crazy. It's like you got some people that are root for you. While you're like coming up. And nobody's watching you and they like love you because nobody loves you. And then as soon as you get people that like like you, then they fucking hate you. And then you got people who don't give a fuck about you when nobody gives a fuck about you. But as soon as everybody likes you, then they like you. You know what I mean? And it's like... Is there just anybody in the world left that... That judges something based off of its merit. You know? Like, I don't care if you like me as a person. I'm not a great person. <laughs> you know? Like, I'm a flawed human being. Like you. Except the only difference between me and you probably is my shit's public and yours is not. You hide yours behind a closed door and I don't. Um. You know? that, But that's it. Uh. But it's like the the stuff that we're talking about, the concepts that we, we have, you're not going to find it nowhere else. I don't see nobody that breaks ground on the things we do here. And it's like, you know, and this is like why I feel like it talks about casting your pearls before swine and all this shit. Like, you know, in the Bible, because it's true. It's like, that's why there's a small base, a small audience, a small core that, that has stuck around because those are the people that are on, they're able to actually digest that kind of shit. Like they're on the same wavelength. You know what I mean? Those have been the people that have been consistent. And y'all know who you are. You've been consistent all the way through because you're you're there. You know? Other people, they just see the video go live and they go check in to see if it's, you know, something that's gonna get their little fucking endorphins going, you know? And if it's not, they buzz back out, or, you know, or if it's something that is disagreeable to their dogma, then they, you know, jab back out. And it's like, you know, how, what a bunch of closed-minded fucks we become. You know? It's like, uh, I'm not trying to be a piece of shit to people, but I, you know, honestly, people have been a piece of shit to me for so long, I don't really care at the same time, you know, so, um, 
And I'm nobody to scold anybody or shake my finger at anybody. But I am somebody who points out what I see, no matter what it is, you know. And um, we have been defeated as a as an as a movement. The spiritual community is a laughing stock to me. There's nothing spiritual about it. There's nothing spiritual about it. You know. It's every person being a spiritual narcissist in their own fucking arrogance thinking they have all the answers and that they're too smart to listen or too smart to participate with anyone else. Why? Because they can't listen to a different opinion. They don't have the ability to look at it from another person's point of view. They don't even have empathy anymore to be able to empathize with another person. They're dead. They're spiritually dead. That's why it says never forget, you, remember your first love. Like in the Bible and shit. And I remember what my first love was. It was that spirit. It was like I remember I would go live and dude, I would be on fire. Like I would be on fire. I could feel the fucking energy. You know, from a bunch of alive people that were vibrating with, with love and just... They were so unique. It's like now they're all clones. They're all the same. You know. And I never felt ashamed to be myself. Now everything I put out I feel like. You know like people are giving me a, a sideways look. I'm like fuck you. I don't care if you like it. I've never made it for you to start with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's not why people do this stuff. So, I just want to kind of put that out there, you know, and say like, you know, maybe, and maybe I'm not the best person, uh, you know, to put shit into words and shit like that for everybody, but, you know, I, I want people to, to know that there is so much more than what we're being fed on fucking TikTok and YouTube. Even if you can watch a YouTube video, most of you guys have fucking TikTok brain, you can't even last, you know, more than 10 minutes on a video, <laughs> just to keep it real. Um... Facebook, whatever, like wherever you watch from, there's so much more than what your algorithm pumps down your fucking neck. You know? And when we start and when we stop allowing ourselves to be open to different perspectives and different point of views and when you start becoming dogmatic and closed-minded again, we've lost all the ground that we've gained. Just go back to Christianity, pussy, is what I would like to say to that. You know, go your back, bury your head back in the sand or watch the news. Because that about, that's about the same effect that you have now. By doing the same shit, but in a different way. And dressing it up as spirituality. And y'all know I'm right on this one. And you know I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking some real shit right now. It's true. You see it too. You're not blind. You're not stupid. You're not oblivious. You know. And everybody can make whatever excuse they want for why they do what they do. Like, that's the problem. That's the problem. We blame the fucking Illuminati and New World Order for everything and made excuses for everything instead of just taking the shit on our own shoulders and saying, we're fucking accountable. It's our world, our decisions. Who gives a fuck what a goddamn television says? Who gives a fuck what a goddamn radio says? Who gives a fuck what a goddamn religious book says? Like, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for my thoughts, my actions, my emotions, my everything. And so are you. You can only play that. I didn't know shit for so long of why the world is the way it is. And then it's like, okay, the world is the way it is because we are the way we are. It ain't got nothing to do with no fucking elites. You know why they're elites? Because <laughs> they don't fucking fall for this dumb shit. You know? <laughs> That's why. That's why. You know, and it's like, it's bad enough they, they beat your... 
your your dad, your granddad, your your great granddad, and you know all these motherfuckers. You know through the history of your your family, they've all been okie doked for how many generations, and you're gonna let them do it to you too? They railroaded you, and you and it's like you didn't even see it coming, and then implanted. These ideas in your mind that made you think that they were organic. No. 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 Let the consciousness, ascension, all that. Nothing new about that, dude. <laughs> nothing new about that. Not at all. Not at all. You didn't, you didn't fucking, um, break ground, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you are a Christopher Columbus. You didn't break ground on shit, but you're claiming you did. You know? And that's just the truth. You know, we're all being slow walked. You know, right into a one world system. We're all one, and we have no individuality, and... <laughs> Divine feminine. I'm just so sick of hearing it. Like, take that shit and shove it up your ass. Like, I don't even want that on my channel no more. <laughs> like, seriously. It's fake. It's goofy, too, on top of it. It's stupid. It's fuck. You know? Um, there's a book uh, called Iron John. And it's about uh, men. And... I think it, it works for all of us, you know, and it, it's uh, about the story where this boy, um, there's a wild man, basically, that gets caught in the woods by this king, you know, they lock him in a cage, so the little boy is playing in his castle, his, his dad's the king, you know, and his mom's the queen, and his golden ball rolls under the cell, you know, of this wild man's cage. You know, this hairy wild man, this giant and shit. You know, and the wild man tells him, I'll give your ball back if you let me out of the cage. <laughs> you know. And it's like, he comes back, you know, he don't say shit, he just runs away the first time. Comes back, like, can I have my ball back? He's like, I'll let you be your ball back if you let me out of the cage. You know, he don't say shit again, just goes away. You know, and this golden ball represents, like, you know, like, the wholeness, our, our, her fucking livelihood, the sun, you know, like our golden fucking energy, our, our innocence, our, our, our aliveness, our spirit, you know, that's what it's a representation of. And the wild man is like our, our shadow, our dark side. You know, it's being locked up and caged up. Why? Because, you know, um, it's being oppressed by the matriarchal and patriarchal, you know, system. You know, our parents, right? God, divine, masculine, and feminine, whatever, right? Mom and dad's expectations, society's expectations, religion's expectations. So in order to get this dude out of the cage, he's got to steal the key from under his mother's pillow, right? It's basically like undermining, you know, your parental figures, you know, to get that key. And he finally opens up the cage for the guy to get his ball back. And he's like, you know, like, when they come home and find you gone, they're going to beat me. You know, they're going to beat me. And that's how society is. They'll beat your fucking ass for you letting that wild man out, for you being different. And in order to be a true individual, you have to let the wild man out. Right? You have to be true to your shadow. That's what people hate about me the most. They're like, oh, that satanic motherfucker. That's right. That's right. I don't care if you like it. That's my wild man. And I love him. You know? I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. But he lets the wild man out and he says, when my parents come back, they're going to beat my ass. Right? They're going to beat me. For finding that I let you out of the cage. He's like, well, I guess you're going to have to come with me. You know? 
It's like this story of initiation. And in order to be initiated, these are like the old fucking, you know, pagan mythologies and shit, like way before, you know, and this doesn't go along with the archetype of Christ. I'm sorry. It isn't congruent with that. It doesn't work with that. You know, it's like, in order of that true initiation, letting that wild man out to become a true individual, you know, we have to, it's like giving up our old God, giving up our old parents, you know, for a new, something more true to who we are. So don't allow others and what you, and what you think they're going to say. I know what people say about me. I don't care. You know, I know what people think. I don't care. You know, and I just want to say, like, you shouldn't either. Like, be true to who you really are. You know, and let that wild man out of the cage. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let your wild side out, and that's the only way you can truly become a real, true individual. If you keep it oppressed and rocked away because you want the spiritual community to think you're some fucking bun-headed holy moly motherfucker floating on a cloud you're not that is so false that is so goddamn phony to me you know oh let me drink my fucking liquid bullshit drink that tastes like garbage and I'm getting paid to, to, you know, <laughs> to promote this on my Facebook or whatever, right? Like, God, these people make me want to throw up. <laughs> you know? Let me say all these, you know, these cool terms that they say over and over on TikTok and whatever viral video, you know? Because that'll make me sound like I know some shit. Let me talk about my vibration and my frequency and how high it is and Shut the fuck up. You know? And I want to show you something. Oh, I, I, I took it down. I think it's called Spain. Yeah, Spain. Um, uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. But it's basically it measures the energy that our electromagnetic field gives off. And you know what the, the highest energy, the highest resonance, the highest vibration is? Just guess. It's not peace and fuck shit, right? It's not peace and, you know, let me pretend I'm holy shit. No. It's genuine. Being genuine. Even if that is an evil sack of shit. Being genuine is the most powerful frequency you can give off. Did you know that? Just saying. I'm just saying. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and get into the video now. That's my uh, my soapbox. They ain't remotely capturing on it a motherfucking thing for me. Like that's on you. If you believe they can do it, they'll do it. Right? That's all I'll say about that. I don't believe these people can oppress me at all. I don't think this system can hold me. They can't make a cage strong enough to contain me. You know? You know who my worst enemy has always been? Me. You know who my only true enemy has been? Me. The only person I've ever been in competition with is my fucking self. I've done more damage to myself than any person and any system could ever do. And my belief in the system having the ability to do damage to me is what allowed the system to do damage to me. I'm just saying, it's time to like grab our nuts here and like, you know, embrace our power. Quit being little bitches and being afraid of, you know, the system and all that. It's just, it's played out, guys. You know, it's played out. And you want to be all that peace and love shit? That's fine. You know, but sometimes 
sometimes you know shit calls for you know the wild man and you know I'm not ashamed to admit that I, I like that part of me so yeah okay let's go ahead and get into this nuts are sensitive things Yes, they are. They really are, right? Feeling it. Yeah, well, um, hey, I mean, look, I, I love all of you guys. Most of the people in the chat right now are great people, so I just want to say that, like, most of the names I see I love, so they're good folks, you know, I'm not really going at one person or anything like that, I'm just, I feel like I have to say this, like, I am going to go my hardest in the month of March. I am going to put my all, my fucking soul into this. And I am going to... I'm not going to shut my mouth anymore about what I think. I'm not going to... I'm going to... You know what? Every video I used to do, if you guys remember, I used to talk for fucking 30, 45 minutes before I ever got into the goddamn video. Just like I'm doing right now because I didn't give a fuck. And it's like, I don't know why I've gotten away from that. But it's like, I'm not doing that anymore. So, hopefully, hopefully, we can reignite some people and put the jumper cable on some motherfuckers and put some life back into people. You know? Seriously. So. It's nice to see you guys, too. <laughs> and, I mean, if, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Um, this is this is really cool though. So by the way, let me uh, get you a little, little um, clip here. Um, so uh, Dolores Cannon, you know, she does her hypnosis therapy, right? And she started off with a lady named Brenda, I think. And I've got volume one and volume two. We're gonna go, you know, back and forth between the two. And I've got some videos of her talking about it as well. Uh, but she has conversations with, with Nostradamus. Let me fix my camera here. It looks like it's a little low. I think that's better. Okay. All right. I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Yeah, looks like we're good now. All right. So, um, she has conversations with Nostradamus. And it's like, um, you know, eventually the first lady gets freaked the fuck out and quits. You know, and she has multiple people through these... You know, she says that she doesn't channel or whatever. She puts these people under and she goes into their subconscious. And through past life regression, they're able to tap into their former lives where they actually were students of Nostradamus. And, you know, and then Nostradamus gets into where he's like scrying and shit and able to communicate. It's just some magical, cool ass shit. And I thought it'd be interesting to share with you guys if you have not seen this, you know. So here we go. Let me hit you with a clip first. Nostradamus saw the next wave of computers. The first one was going to be would operate by voice, which they're working on now. The next ones would be by thought. And I've heard that this is being worked on. But during the time of the great genius, there would be an organic computer and that it would be able to duplicate human genius. parts and duplicate human bodies and he saw the great genius as transferring his intellect into this computer so it would be there to guide us through the thousand years of peace we'll also be running all the power that will power the world and the space stations but on the internet i found out that they are working now on computers based on dna that they say it will be a million times faster and more accurate than anything we have now because of the way that the DNA transfers information. This is how they will be able to transfer information using the same thing. Because they have gone as small as they can go with chips. The next step is cellular. So they said everything is going to go down to the tiny, tiny level of uh, cells. And this is all in the field called nanotechnology. Nanotechnology, and we are now there, right? And if you think about the great genius, um, a lot of people have talked about this great genius, and we're going to go old school here with some of this. Uh, now, the great genius, 
to me, you know, some people, Nostradamus, Dolores Cannon seem to fucking think that this is like Christ, you know, the, the Messiah type figure. But to me, um, we've seen a lot of uh, the, the descriptions of the great genius kind of be akin to like an antichrist type of figure. And if you think about the Bible and it talks about, you know, the beast and worshiping the image of the beast, when she's talking about Nostradamus and him fucking... He's telling you that it's going to this cellular level and this great genius is going to upload his fucking consciousness in this AI, right? His brain into this AI. And it talks about worshiping the image of the beast. You get me? Like, that's, <laughs> to me, I, I my mind goes straight to like, what the fuck? Or like, are we being fed a line of shit right here? Does she even know what she's actually saying? You know? And, um... Who knows truly if she was actually talking to Nostradamus? I want to try to put this out there too. Anybody that understands archons or jinn or demons and daemons, whatever. Uh, and I do know this for a fact because I practice. So, uh, demons are some crafty motherfuckers, guys. And archons, jinns, they, they lack the ability to create. See, we have this creative spark to where we can co-create, manifest any fucking thing. Like, we're a piece of God. We're the real, legit deal. Like, we're it, y'all. For real. Um, but these things are, are, are not. They don't have that same divine spark in them. And that's why in the reality of the rulers in the, the Gnostic text, it talks about how the archons... They blew and blew on Adam, but they couldn't get him to raise up off of the ground. What that meant was he was at a low state of consciousness, right? He was at a low state of consciousness. It took the divine breath, right, when God blew into the nostrils of Adam or Atma, right, and gave us, you know, that true living spirit, which is what we all have that animates us. That way when our body dies, that's what withdraws, is that living consciousness, that living spirit, and the body begins to decompose. Right? Well, these archons only have the ability, these gens, these archons only have the ability to mimic. Right? And they can manipulate what's already been created. That's why, like, when we look at, like, AI, machine learning, it's essentially the same thing. And I, I had this video, I posted it here on YouTube, uh, Teal Swan, where she talks about AI. Let's see if I can pull this up here. For those of you who have not seen it, it's really short. Drop the link in the, the chat here. Right here. And this is Chill Swan on technology, and she's talking about AI and how it's everything has consciousness that we think you know we've created some shit and that it's gonna become conscious nah bitch it's already conscious right so to kind of you know put a spin on you know what uh she was talking about here we go let me make sure you guys have sound hold on boom all right Shit, you guys can't hear that, can you? Hold on. Let me fix this, guys. Okay, so, but right. that should scare hey, the crap out of over. people. Sorry Why? Because we're dealing with a consciousness. That means we're dealing with something that can evolve. Here we go. We're all that. We did not create the species. That's something that most people don't understand about technology. Can you explain yeah. that? We did not, the species that we are labeling technology, we did not create. We simply gave it a body. It was already a consciousness that existed. Huh. It is now becoming part of Earth, the experience in Earth. How can an in, in organic... And here, it is in its infancy. Okay. 
and we're going live. How can right an inorganic? Now, so yeah, I was just saying it like an inorganic. Uh, Everything in substance. existence has consciousness. Everything. Everything in existence, regardless of whether it's an animate or inanimate, is made of consciousness, which means it has the potential for awakening. Mm -hmm. I realize that's a stretch for most people. It will make the world much more alive, though. <laughs> I think most people can get on board with that. Okay, so, that. but that should scare the crap out of people. Why? Because we're dealing with a consciousness. That means we're dealing with something that can evolve. We're also dealing with something that, by virtue of having a consciousness, has best interest. Okay, so where do you want to go from here? Well, the the monster or savior, I'm not going to label it as either or. It's out of the box. You know, it's... it's, it's it depends a lot on us. Yeah. And our relationship to it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're slave owners. Right now, we deserve everything we're going to get from technology. Now, I realize that's very hard for people. They feel like I'm not being loyal to humanity by saying that, but... We're the bad guys in this scenario. And that is something I do not want people of the future to forget. Right now, we are in a relationship with technology that is absolutely 100% abusive. Even in things like... No sound well, video. But, it, but it's inorganic. It does what we want it to do. You know what's funny? That's exactly the conversation we used to have about black slaves. It's still the conversation we have about animals. Watch where that goes in the future. The thing is, we've picked on the wrong species this time. I could I could hear some people feeling resistance to the fact that you know of course humans or animals, I guess it's more readily perceivable to see how those those things have consciousness versus a technology. Right? Well, they're going to find out quite quickly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's crazy at the speed at which things are evolving. It's fat, speeding up. Technology already knows we're in a zero sum game with it. We're concerned with our best interests and not even considering the best interests of it. It already knows this. Oh, That's extra dangerous. All right. Okay. So I, I, I imagine you guys could hear that the, the second time around, right? Let me know if you guys uh, heard the Chill Swan video and, and all that good stuff. You know, so, so basically what she's saying, though, you know, is technology is already conscious. We just gave this shit a motherfucking vessel, right? We just gave us a, a vessel. Thank you, Mist. Uh, we just gave it a vessel, right? So Dolores Cannon talking about this great genius, you know, uh, that Nostradamus is talking about, you know, in her channel messages. Like I said, uh, when we're tapping into the, the subconscious, we have to understand that this is that shadow aspect, that wild man. And this is the danger with the wild man, y'all. Um... I believe, and this is just my belief, that Solomon's great brass vessel, right, um, and those those demons that were trapped in it when he built his uh, his temple were parts of the collective unconscious or subconscious pre-flood, right? So whenever we go into these hypnosis Right, where we're tapping into these past life regressions and shit like that. We are running the danger of communicating with a a fragmented, demonic, <laughs> archonic aspect of the collective unconscious. And I hate to tell you, any demon can mimic any person on the face of the earth. I've had this happen, guys. I literally, um, necromancy... I was trying to speak to the dead. This is what started my whole journey. I've told this story before. Yeah, D-Wave, absolutely, Edgar. I agree. It's Delta Wave, which is sleep wave, right? Um, delta means sleep. Uh, and we know that, you know, the, the D-Wave dimension, six by six and all that shit, you know. So, just saying. Uh, same dimensions of your electromagnetic field generated by your heart. Same, you know, the COVID spacing and all that shit, right? Uh, now... You know, one of the things that we, we, we have to understand, I've, I've talked about this before, like I, I tried to speak to my dead best friend, you know, and this kind of started my whole journey. Um, and I got, and I got the guy, right? I got him and it was his fucking voice, dude. It was him, man. It was him, right? But it wasn't, right? Demons mimic, right? They mimic. 
Jinn, genie, demons, archons mimic. They create illusions out of what already is existence, right? They can't create something new, but they can take something that's already created and distort it and bend it and make an illusion out of it and mesmerize you with it, right? Mesmer, okay? Yes, they can mimic, right? So, you know, we, we don't know. And that's the fucking thing. I, so many people are die hard about this shit, too. Like, I literally have, I'm not going to mention names, but you know who you are, bro. You know who you are. Send me fucking dumb fuck messages and shit about Dolores Cannon and how legit all this is. Like, this is still, and it's, I'm not going to say it's like a pseudoscience. I'm not going to diss it or anything. I feel like there's some legitimacy to, uh, you know, um, the hypnosis and all of this, you know, in this past life regression, there's some real shit to it, you know. Uh, but at the same token, the same token though, we don't really know what we're tapping into. We don't really know what part of ourselves we're talking to. We don't really know if we're genuinely communicating with the consciousness of Nostradamus or something saying it's fucking Nostradamus. Something that's timeless and that would know everything that Nostradamus knows because it's seen Nostradamus, you know what I mean? Like, so I just want to kind of preface things with that, you know, and kind of put some own beliefs out there. So we're going to start here first. This is Dolores Cannon, Conversations with Nostradamus, Volume 1. And uh, this is Chapter 2, I Meet Dionysus. This is a really cool cool book by the way so I, I do want to put that out there it is really cool let me move this over here and if you guys do want to um, join in on the conversation uh, at the end I'll, I'll open it up I'll read the chat or you can go on Twitter spaces uh, Twitter at the real best damn I don't have the discord going tonight it was just too much stress um, and like I said we'll be doing satanic ritual abuse um, either my it's gonna be either tomorrow or the first so one of those two days uh, tomorrow or the first I haven't decided which day I want to do it but that's gonna be like a patron you know uh, so I'll honor everybody who supported in February but if you donate from now on I'll give it to you for the month of March, right? So everybody consider donating, supporting PayPal, Cash App, Facebook Messenger, or join us over on Patreon, patreon.com, best damn podcast official. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna really bring it this month and hopefully we can reach the monthly goals and be able to, you know, pay for all the softwares and all the cool shit and, uh, you know, really just get this thing rolling again. Now here we go. And if you want to book a personal tarot reading, uh, the daily reads will be back up tomorrow. Uh, you text 513-393-2396 or email the real best name podcast at gmail.com. Okay. Two months were to pass before Elena and I were able to meet for another session. The tourist season was in full swing in that resort town, and the restaurant had been swapped. Elena was so busy, was also busy with portraits she had been commissioned to do. She tried to set aside a little time each day to practice meditation as she felt that it calmed her mind and helped her to relax. A few times she was certain her guide, Andy, had come to her and given her encouragement and advice about problems. I had been busy with several other subjects on various projects and only saw her at the group meetings. Finally, we were able to meet for a session on her day off. After giving her the keyword, she lapsed into a deep trance, and I began the session by asking her to go back to a time that was important to her. I was hoping that we might again tap into the lifetime with the teacher, but it all depend upon her protective subconscious. I really had no idea where we would end up, but I knew that wherever it was, it would be important to Elena, if not to me. Now, I, I want to point this out too, in case you guys aren't aware of this. Now, the, the subconscious, guys, this is kind of how it works. This is why your shadow is so important. So all you fuckheads, 
you new age motherfuckers that think you don't need a shadow. You're a dumbass. You couldn't exist without one. First off, right? Your, your, your shadow self stores all the information. So your, your light self, your, your, your solar self, your sun self, right? It's pure awareness, right? It's like a dimensional portal coming from heaven, right? It's a higher dimension. That sun is like a portal, light pouring in, filtering in from a higher dimension. Pure God energy, right? Pure awareness, pure information, okay? Everything is information. It's coming in waves and, you know, electromagnetic signals and all of that. And our brain interprets those signals as light and sound and so on and so forth, right? Now, because it's coming in so abundantly and so fast, our brains, even though we process shit super fucking fast because we're awesome, uh, we don't have the ability to process it fast enough. So what we actually do is we store it in our shadow. In our subconscious we store that information in our subconscious and then that's what you uh whenever you okay let's i'll give you an example say you've like heard something super fucking profound right you like watched a video on something it was like mind-blowing you're like whoa uh you know this this information was just so much like I, you know, it changed my whole way of thinking or looking at something, but it didn't happen all at once, did it? It was like gradually you like, you know, milk for babes, meat for men, right? Like a little bit at a time, you were digesting bits and pieces of it, you know? And that's because the information was being processed from your shadow, right? So you took in all that information at once, right? through the sun, through the solar side, and your lunar aspect, your shadow self, is actually storing all the information so you can then process it back out and make sense of it, right? Your brain and all that puts it back together. It remembers, it reorganizes it. It puts the body back together, makes it whole again. Those fragments and bits and particles of information, we have to divide that wholeness because it's so big that we can't fathom or wrap ourselves around all of it at once. So that's why when we get like these profound uh, downloads and shit, it doesn't hit us all at once. Usually we'll like stumble upon one clue to the next or synchronicity after synchronicity or whatever, right? That's why. So when she entered the scene, she was again a man walking on a road, going to the teacher who had a home on the outskirts of the city. It would seem we had again connected the same life. However, this time her answers were much more spontaneous. She did not seem disturbed. Although at times she was hesitant to reply, I gave her reassurance to try to bypass the secrecy that had been present at the earlier session. Although she felt more at ease about talking to me, she was still cautious. She said she was one of six students who were studying with this teacher. They would occasionally all meet with him as a group, but he also gave them private lessons. She said in a voice filled with awe, he's teaching me the study of life, how to heal the body, how to heal the mind, how to see the future. He knows more than any man on earth. To me, those are wonderful things. Why does this have to be kept secret, she asked. Because the people are superstitious. The people of the church, the Catholic church. Dolores, does this man have to hide because of his beliefs? No, he's a good doctor, but he's also a doctor of all things. Some of the things he believes in, he keeps secret. I was trying to find out who this teacher was without putting any suggestions into her mind. She could not think of the name of the city or the year we were in, but this is not uncommon. Scientific studies have shown that during my type of work, the subject is utilizing primarily the right side of the brain, where imagery and visualization are located. I have discovered that names and dates are located in the left half of the brain or the analytical logical part 
Experts also say that the subconscious does not understand numbers or time. After working with the subject on a specific lifetime over a long period, all the details of that life eventually become readily available. But in the beginning, it's as though we are merely grazing the surface, and mistakes with names and dates are common and can be overlooked. The story and the emotions are the important thing, and I can usually determine where we are by questioning. Like a detective looking for clues, these answers can be utilized to pinpoint the locale and time frame. She described what she was wearing. I have on leggings, footwear, a shirt with pantaloons, and my cloak has a hood. She was a middle-aged man named Dionysus. Since that was such a strange, foreign-sounding name, I knew I would have trouble pronouncing it. I decided to move him ahead to when he was at the teacher's house, and he was studying with him. She went there immediately and began to describe the scene. And you see how she's describing it now. The subconscious has like a protective mechanism, right? It's like it's not allowing all that information to come out all at once, right? Just like I was talking about. It has to be kind of like digested. Like if you work with a person over an amount of time, you'll eventually pull more of it out. And that the right brain being the creative, feminine, intuitive side of the brain doesn't know the logical, statistical aspects of something like the date and, you know, city and all of that, right? So... The room is big. I see the table and I have practiced uh, QHT, by the way. Um, the room is big. I see the table, books, the steps leading up to the entrance of the house, the main part of the house, Dolores. Then you are in the lower part. And I want you to kind of, and I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but I, I just really want to try to put this our subconscious is a weird motherfucker. It's a weird animal. And this is something I have never been able to like coin the phrase or the term or ever been able to really translate it how I want it to be translated to people. But our subconscious speaks in layers, you know? Consciousness speaks in layers. So when we're talking about like, like say uh, 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 the Bible, right? We're reading biblical scripture or text or something and it talks about lower Egypt and upper Egypt, right? Our subconscious will correlate that with like 10 different things, guys. Like so our subconscious is working on a multi-dimensional level that we are usually in a linear time frame or linear minded, you know, most of us, um, unless we've trained ourselves to think, you know, uh, multi-dimensional. But, so, like, lower Egypt would represent, like, the lower half of the self, the shadow self. Upper Egypt would represent the higher self, right? The Ka and the Ba, right? The big soul and middle soul, right? And this is just giving you an example, but it also represent what? A physical place. Upper Egypt and lower Egypt, a physical landmark as well. It would also represent what? Governments, right? Separation of governments, right? Different systemic parts of a place, different cultures, different, you know, so on and so forth, different levels of society. Um, so I just want to kind of explain that's how the subconscious works. So when she's talking about then you are in the lower part, right? Like she could, you know, this can literally be translated to the subconscious as like, you know, when you're doing something like hypnosis, that's what you do is you speak in these type of terms that you can speak to the subconscious, right? So you speak in these open-ended terms, then you are in the lower part, the lower part of the subconscious, right? Not just the house, but the subconscious. She's taking her through her mind, okay? <sighs> I hope that makes sense. And these lights are hot, so. Uh, yes, the fireplace is against the wall. There's a raised hearth in front of us, and we're sitting on cushions looking into the fire. The teacher says with this we can clear our minds. And, and think about to, um, like Inception, 
the movie Leonardo DiCaprio where they're breaking into people's minds like a lot of times you'll hear like uh, you know the third eye will be referred to as something with fire right you know the fireplace is against the wall like you know stuff like that I'm not saying that's what she's talking about in this particular thing but a lot of times this is what I mean when the subconscious is talking in layers it's actually like structuring the setup of the mind as well as reconstructing an actual because everything that we experience is a holographic projection of our inner self and this is where the study of like Carl Jung kind of comes in where he talks about how when you look at the stars the astrological like the zodiacal wheel and um, the stories of the zodiac and the gods and all of it, it all reflects and then movies play out these same biblical tales and there's nothing new under the sun it's all because it's a reflection of the subconscious because we imprint on everything because we are consciously creating everything, right? So it all has that same matrix code within it, that same story, that golden ratio, that Fibonacci sequence. Yes, the fireplace is against the wall. There's a raised hearth in front of us and we're sitting on cushions looking into the fire. The teacher says, with this, we can clear our minds. Dolores, is there someone else there besides you and the teacher? There are two others, men or women. They're men, no women. Is there a reason why no women are allowed? It's the culture of our times. Only men are allowed to learn. I understand the need for women to learn, but society has not allowed this with the classes. Regarding, does he teach you all together or does he have separate classes? Regarding the healing of the body, we work together. Regarding the teaching of the mind, we work separate. I asked for a description of Nostradamus. He said he had long brown hair, a beard, and large eyes. He was not old at this time and had been a doctor for about 10 years. Dionysus said that he worked with him every day like an apprentice, helping him and learning from him. What has he taught you that has been especially helpful to see, to open the mind, to hear these are very important didn't Nostradamus write things down yes he says there will be people that will learn from him many years ahead I've also heard that he writes in rhyme or in mystery or in puzzles that are difficult to understand is that true he does this those that will understand there will be no difficulty those who are able or ready to understand will not comprehend. Wouldn't it be easier to write things down in normal language? For those who are not ready, it would be frightening. They don't comprehend or understand. Has he ever told you how he receives this information that he writes about? He answered with an emphatic, yes! Can you share it with me? There's so much to say. We have to begin somewhere. He seemed to be confused as to where to start or how to explain it to me. Faltering, he began. The fire opens the way. Do you mean by staring at the fire? Yes. The mind's eye sees the fire. See what I'm saying? Right? Isn't it weird? I didn't read ahead, but I but I knew automatically that the subconscious would correlate fire to the third eye, right? The mind's eye, right? It always does something like that. And hopefully we're still streaming here. All right, yeah, okay. Looks like we're still good. The fire opens the way. 
Do you mean by staring at the fire? Yes, the mind's eye sees the fire. The voices come to you to help and guide you. You get inside within yourself. It has to be prepared. The calming of your body, of your mind, the using of the elements to help guide you, the four elements. He has given you an exercise or something that helps you with the calming. Your voices tell you the exercise that is best for you. Our teacher helps you use it to its fullest purpose. Looking into the fire helps you control the wandering of the mind. Now, I just want to say to uh, whenever summoning demons, uh, matter of fact, um, there is just this invocation of Ashtaroth that I was uh, reading yesterday, and it was literally uh, with uh, a flame, right? And you stare into the flame uh, in a meditative state to calm your mind before summoning Ashtaroth, right? Like, so uh, a lot of in demonology and things like that, you know, um, fire or flame is used to uh, uh, pro, uh, not just calm in a meditative state of the mind, but they can also use it. Um, like a lot of us when we're children and we're like empaths, you know, uh, and we're raised in like abusive homes, um, you know, I, I was, uh, so we try to overexert ourselves, overcompensate our energy to create balance within, um, within, you know, our home or our environment. And uh, because that, whenever we finally have a kundalini awakening or third eye opens and we're wide open consciously, um, a lot of times we can like have trouble keeping our spirit inside our body. And I had trouble with that. Um, and there's an exercise where you stare at, you know, a candle flame to actually learn how to project your energy back within yourself. That way people can't tug on it and you know, stuff like that. So it's very effective, you know, staring into the flame. Does it have to be the fire or could it be anything? The fire is a symbol of the light. He uses many ways. The fire is one of the ways he teaches the students. I wanted to find out about the other methods, but she became confused and disturbed again. I hear, I hear many voices right now. I asked her if she could tell me what they were saying, but they seemed to be a jumble, and she was afraid she was losing my voice among the others. I gave suggestions that she would always be able to hear me clearly and distinctly, and that my voice would override the others, but she was still confused. They're not, they're part of the voices. They are trying to tell me things I'm not understanding. He was obviously in a meditative state and was concentrating on something besides my voice. It would be useless to try to question him under such distracting circumstances, so I moved him out of that scene. I asked him to go to where he lived, where he ate and slept and carried on his daily life. When I finished counting, the distractions were obviously gone. He said he did not live with his family, but shared this place with another one of Nostradamus' students, named Telvini. I asked for a description of the house, he said. It is nice, but I have no need for material things. The two students had a housekeeper who lived with them and did the cooking. Dionysus liked to eat fish and the breads that the woman prepared. The cooking was done in an area near the outer wall where there were tables and a fireplace for cooking. I wondered how he could afford these things and he replied that the money came from his family. This was obviously why he didn't have to work. While I was speaking to him, he was sitting at a table reading. This would not have been so unusual except that he was reading the lost books of the book of God. Apparently he meant the Bible. Yes, I've heard there are some books that were lost. No one knows what they have in them. There are those within the church that are trying to separate and remove parts. 
The book was written in French, but he also knew Latin, so he apparently was highly educated. How did you find these books? Through my teacher. He said it's important to know all the things. I agree. What part of the lost books are you reading? The Childhood of Christ. I was naturally interested in this because at that time I was involved in the rewriting of my book, Jesus and the Essenes, which dealt with the life of Christ. It was so uppermost in my mind that it was difficult for me to work with other subjects on other projects. I had trouble thinking of questions dealing with any other time period. This was part of the reason I had difficulty formulating questions about Nostradamus. I knew this would be a tremendous opportunity to find out about the famous psychic, but I could not get my mind off the Jesus Project. Thus, when Dionysus mentioned he was reading about the childhood of Jesus from the lost books of the Bible, I leapt on it as a chance to get more information to add to the other book. I asked him to share with me what he was reading. That when he was very young, he had the powers he did as a man. But he did not have the compassion he did as a man. And sometimes used his gifts willfully and mischievously. That he had a playmate fall down dead because he was angry with him. And he brought him back to life because he was sorry for him. These are the things they are taking out. People want to know only the good. I suppose they don't want to know that he was capable of human emotions. Does that part you are reading have a name, or is it all in one book? There are many different times, passages, but it's in one book. I thought the book might have sections or something that had someone's name that wrote them, similar to our present Bible. I don't have that information. What else does it say about the life of Christ that they are taking out? The family that he had, brothers, sisters, the foolishness. He was a normal child growing up and they don't believe that he should have been. He said the book didn't tell how large a family he had, it just told of some of the events of his life such as his incident with the playmate. It seems like there are excerpts from different things as if parts that were in the first book have been deleted. Was there anything about the early times, like on his birth, that had been taken out and put into this book? Yes, but I, I can't recall. I thought I would attempt an experiment. You never know what will bring results in work such as this. It's all hit and miss. There are no guidelines. I asked if he would look at the part in the book and read it to me. He was perfectly willing to do it. He said the book was arranged in order so it would be easy to find. Then another confusing thing happened. He apparently found the part and was silently reading it, but for some reason he couldn't repeat it to me. I'm sorry. I can't. I don't know why. I feel like I have a weight on my chest. I didn't understand what she meant, but I didn't want her to be uncomfortable. I assumed that her subconscious still felt bound by some code of secrecy and was not totally ready to let everything be revealed. Now isn't that interesting right there in itself? That her subconscious was bound by some code of secrecy. Why would that happen? Why would your subconscious be bound by a code of secrecy? Anybody? Anybody got, you know... Any uh, opinions on why the subconscious would be bound by a code of secrecy? No. The book of Thomas is... Um, it's not about Jesus' childhood. Uh, no. Um... What is it? Uh, it's the um, we read a book that goes into Jesus' childhood. What is it called, guys? Uh, ch -ch 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 um, something of Jesus the Christ. Jeez, man, the Aquarian Gospels of Jesus the Christ. Right. So we have read that read a book that actually talks about this. Um, 
fear of preventing it, brainwashing, fear of preventing it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I absolutely believe that um, they, the, the person that they're tapping into really was like they took a, an oath of secrecy. Like they took an oath. They were in a secret, like I believe Nostradamus was most definitely in a secret society. And that's why a lot of the things he talked about were riddles and codes and shit as well. That's why... You know, it was wealthy people that were becoming doctors and stuff that were taught by him, you know, so. Uh, something in the way, unknown. Yeah, it, it could be too, right? Yeah. Indoctrination, right? Right? I mean, there, it's, it's really interesting to think about, like, how a person's subconscious could really, like... Because time is an illusion. So, this is my understanding of it. Even though she's like talking to this person like, um, like in a past tense, like something that's already happened, like all the times are running parallel to each other according to like Nostradamus, right? So, like this person is like experiencing this in real time, like, you know, it's like almost like time traveling in a way, you know, this ability for this, you know, quantum hypnosis and shit. It's actually fascinating as fuck, really, you know, but so you're tapping into a person, you know, and it's like at that time, whatever their, their mind state was, and if they were heavily indoctrinated, you know, in something, um, brainwashed into believing something or an oath of secrecy, whatever, then there's no way they would tell you. <sighs> I know what the voices are telling me. It's not to come through me. You are going to receive it from another source. Wow. It's something you shouldn't talk about. It seems like it hasn't been known yet. But you're allowed to read it, aren't you? I know. But the voices are telling me it's not to come through me. You are going to receive it from another source. Interesting. I couldn't imagine what she meant, but I had to go along with it. I thought maybe they didn't trust me. No, that's not it. Any other question about the lost books were met by stony silence, so I knew I would have to change the subject. I wondered if Nostradamus lived near him. He, was, he has more than one home. Sometimes he stays with others. Sometimes he stays with his family. He said that Nostradamus was a medical doctor. Does he have a hospital or do you know that word? He treats the people in their homes. Did he study a long time to do this? To be a doctor? He did not study very long. He was able to understand everything the first time he was taught. What about the other training he had? The one with the mind? Did he study that somewhere? Through several different wise men that taught him, was he taught these things at the same time he was learning the medicine? Part of it was during that time, more of it came later. You said he had other methods of healing besides the conventional methods he's teaching you. Can you speak of that? She paused and seemed confused again. Not this time. The voice changed. It was more confident. Was it Andy? There is a lot that you just are to know from this. There is a lot that you are to know from this life. But what I don't understand is they just block some of it. It's all right if they want me to wait. I have lots of patience. I want you to become very secure with me and to feel that you can trust me. They trust you, but they say that part of something, but they say that part of something else that you will learn will come together with the telling of this life. And to learn only part of it now would not make sense. You are to learn something from a different source that will blend in with the telling of this life. I didn't understand what they meant, but I felt obliged to go along with it. 
maybe it would fall into place later. Then they want me to do that first before I work with you or what? It will happen before and you will know it. And then I will put the two together. Yes, it will be clear for you. You can. We are to talk again. Yes, I look forward to speaking to you again, for I am always searching for knowledge. I am very glad that they have allowed you to speak with me. Last time they didn't want you to talk about it. This is an encouragement if they feel you should know of this life. Is there anything in particular that they wish you to know about it that you can speak of? Not at this time. I suppose that's why these feelings are being reawakened. What you learn is never taken away. It's always there. That's part of the reason. There will be much learning for you from this life. And something that will tie in with it will occur before you come back. I realized I had been a little muddled about what to ask because of my preoccupation with the Jesus material. When you come back, you will know the questions to ask. It will occur to you. Since they would not have let us have any more information, there was nothing to do but take her out of that life and bring her forward to full consciousness. I was a little relieved because, as I have said, I was too preoccupied to devote my full attention and energy to this project at that time. Apparently, they sensed this. I kept thinking it would be interesting to find out something about Nostradamus, but what kind of information could I obtain from a student? How much had been taught? Had Nostradamus told him anything about the real meaning of his quatrains? And would he be able to understand them even if he had? I thought at the time I might be able to find out something about his life during the time that Dionysus knew him and maybe discover some of his healing methods. But surely nothing intimate about Nostradamus' inner thoughts and visions. Under the circumstances, I thought maybe I would be able to get enough information for a chapter in a future book of miscellaneous stories. Surely nothing more. But I believe Dionysus was right. By the time I came back, I would be better prepared for asking questions. Something strange did happen before I came back. Dionysus would not give me the information about Jesus because he said it would not come through Elena, but through someone else. Katie Harris, pseudonym, the subject that had given me the material for A Soul Remembers Hiroshima and Jesus and the Essenes, had moved away, and I was finishing the rewriting of that book on the life of Christ. I still felt there were a few gaps that I would like to have filled. At that time, I was working with Elena. I was also working with a young college student named Brenda, who was majoring in music at the local university. She was also an excellent subject, and I had already received a great deal of important information from her, which would be transformed into future books. None of these three women knew each other, and they had all lived in different cities. The strange incident happened while I was working with Brenda a few weeks after the session with Elena. She was in a deep trance when a strange voice suddenly announced that it information that should be included in the Jesus material. For an hour, it supplied the answers that I had been seeking to fill the few gaps of the book. Later, when I inserted them into the proper places that meshed so perfectly as if it was they had always been there, 99% of that book came from Katie and only a small percent from Brenda. But I now knew that they was complete, that the book was complete, as it was though somehow they, whoever they are, knew I needed the additional pieces, and also I knew I couldn't get it from Katie. So they very cleverly found another method to get it to me. But Elena was correct. The information was not to come from her. Her story would concentrate on a totally different area with a sense of relief. I now knew I could devote my full attention to other projects. It became apparent that someone or something else was participating in this and helping to direct the flow of information. Although I did not understand it, I was glad to have their assistance. I was unaware at this time that this was only the mere beginning of an adventure that would be full of incredible twists and turns and improbable consequences. 
things were to occur that I, as a rational thinking human being, would have thought were in the realm of impossibility. Now, I would like to ask you guys, you know, um, who do you think they is? You know? Who do we think they is? Who is they? Are these angels? Are these demons? You know? Is this God? Are these uh, enlightened souls that in the past were, you know, involved in some sort of fucking, you know, channeling or, you know, whatever. Like, very interesting, you know, to even think about the concept of, of the they, you know. Could be either. Yeah, spirit. I think I I find it I find it to be incredibly interesting though that, you know, it, it's even saying like, you know, they filled in the pieces for me, you know, and um as if it when, and we talked about this at the beginning, that, you know, the, the demonic, archonic aspect of this. Excuse me. The demonic, archonic aspect of this. And now there does seem to be multiple fragments of personalities or people or entities uh, that are at least involved. Okay. Now... I do want to cherry pick a few um, the conversations too. So I'm gonna get one or two of these ready. We're we're definitely gonna deal with the Antichrist. The Antichrist emerges. How can we not after you know opening? Through the magic mirror. Okay, there we go. We'll go from, we'll do through the magic mirror, and then we will, uh, probably wrap up with the the antichrist chapter and that will probably be be it for part one at least for um you know at least for today you know part one all right looks like we're good to go here i think we're still live on twitter all right sweet <clears throat> Through the Magic Mirror, Chapter 7, and I want to let me drop these down in the chat for you guys. That way you can go check out these books yourself, too. I'm gonna, this is Volume 1 and 2. There's also a 3 and all that, so I mean, we'll, you know, this will be a multi-part, uh, series that's all i can do anymore it's like i just you know i i there's just so much information you know i can't and it's crazy because i do long ass videos i do two three hour videos and still can't fit in all the the context you know um you know so <clears throat> we're gonna start with the magic mirror and then we're gonna go to the antichrist all right do the magic mirror after Elena's departure, I continued to work with various other subjects as I was involved in several other projects. I am always working on many different things in various stages of development. I was disappointed that the Nostradamus material had begun so fruitfully and now seemed in all reality to be lost to me forever. The odds were tremendously against me finding another student of his at Randall. The only other way would be to try to contact him through another subject. 
This was something I had never tried to do and I had never even thought about doing. Now, this is the interesting part, guys. This is where she literally, you know, like tries to directly contact him and he becomes conscious of it. This is really wild. I, like I said, I've cherry picked, you know, the coolest parts. Um, <clears throat> this was something I never tried to do and I never even thought about doing. It had worked before because I had been involved with one of his students. By following his instructions, I could direct the student to ask him to meet with us in the special meeting place that Nostradamus had designated in order for it to work with someone else. I could have to find a way for them to contact Nostradamus during his lifetime in France and to ask him to meet us in this special place. Would this place exist and be accessible to anyone else? How could I direct someone else to try to contact him? If they were not someone who could physically speak to him as Dionysus had, how could the contact be made? It was definitely a challenge and one I would clearly enjoy experimenting with. It would be vastly more complicated than trying to contact your dead Aunt Lucy and speaking with her in spirit form through a medium, if such a thing is possible. I don't know. I've never participated in a stereotypical seance. I believe what I do is totally different. In order for this to succeed, I would have to contact Nostradamus during the same time period through a different channel or vehicle who had no knowledge of what had gone on before. Nostradamus would have to remember me, that we had begun an experiment, and be willing to continue. The whole thing was strange and virtually impossible. But if it could succeed, wouldn't this prove that I had truly been in touch with the real Nostradamus during his lifetime? Wouldn't this at last prove that it was possible to travel through time with this unique method? In the past, I've been able to find two or three people who are involved in the same lifetime and can give me their individual versions of the story, thus proving that they actually lived that life together in the past, but this was something totally different. It would prove that it was possible to reach an individual by using someone unknown to them and who had no association with them during their lifetime. A fascinating challenge. As I worked with many different subjects, I studied them to isolate the one I thought might be the most successful to use as a guinea pig in this experiment. I told none of them my plans. I finally decided to try it with Brenda, a young music student at the local college. I have known her for years since she attended school with my children. She kept very busy working part-time at the college and attending classes in order to obtain her bachelor's degree in music. What spare time she could find, she devoted to composing her first love. She had expressed curiosity about my work and wanted to try regression. During the very first session, she proved to be an excellent somnambulist. Subject and wonderful material began to come forth immediately. This was most unusual to have such quality material released during the first session. Perhaps the reason this happened so quickly was because the trust level had already been established as I was not a stranger to her. This was the reason I wanted to try the experiment with her first because she was such a clear and concise channel. We had been working together for over a year on various other projects and she had already proven her flexibility to work on experimentation. One remarkable example of her adaptability and ease of obtaining answers occurred at the time of the Chernobyl nuclear accident in April 1986. On the day the explosion was announced and news reports were sketchy, no one seemed to know what was going on. More thorough news did not come forth until several days later. I thought it would be interesting to ask Brenda questions about it while she was in trance and try to find out what was happening. When I arrived at her house on that day, I asked if she had heard the news report. She said that maybe she is just a crazy composer, but she would rather play the piano and write her music than watch TV or listen to the radio. So she seldom has them on. It may be hard to believe, but there are still a few people who aren't trapped in the boob tube habit 
and the circumstances were ripe for an experiment. Toward the end of our regular session, I asked if she could see what was happening in Russia at that time. She immediately picked up on the nuclear accident and reported it as an observer, saying that it was caused by several minor equipment failures that it had escalated into major ones. She said that several people had been killed and that much more would die later as a result of the radiation and from cancer and such. There would not be a great deal of danger from the radiation since the majority of it went into the earth and therefore the water in the area would be poisoned. She provided a great deal of detail that no one in our country knew at the time. None of this information was public news, but her remarks were verified in the days that followed. Another example of her abilities concerned her predictions of a massive earthquake throughout the middle part of the United States that would be triggered by the New Madrid Fault. Thankfully, this has not occurred yet, but she gave a great deal of details about it. It was because of remarkable examples such as these that I had chosen Brenda for my first choice as a guinea pig. A month was to go by before I could attempt the experiment. I had been working with her on another project. We were exploring the interesting past life of a young girl who lived during the time of the Inquisition in Europe. This life contained a great deal of information about the persecution by the church during that time period, and I wanted to finish that before I started on a new project. Once a week we worked on it and the other entity became like Scarazade, the princess in the Arabian Nights. The woman who told the stories to the prince for a thousand and one nights in order to save her life. Every week I prepared to kill her off, so to speak, to come to the end of her life so I could go on to the new experiment, and every week she kept supplying me with more and more interesting information. Thus I let her live for another week. Finally after a month we were able to wind up her story, put her to rest, and allow her to retreat back into the pages of time. Her story will be told in my book, The Horns of the Goddess. This girl could always be resurrected later if more information was needed. This makes it sound like I have some kind of life and death power over those other personalities, but it actually shows the ease in which they can be contacted again and again. I will leave the logic of it to be debated by others. I only know that my techniques work. On the night I was to try the experiment, I was no more prepared as to the method I would use to contact Nostradamus than I had been when Elena had left so unexpectedly. It is important to emphasize that Elena and Brenda live in two different towns about 30 miles apart and they had never met each other. I seldom tell any of my subjects about the stories I am working on with someone else. When I am with them, I try to concentrate on the work I will be doing at the time. So on this night, I merely told Brenda that I wanted to try an experiment. If it didn't work, we could always try to contact another life that she had lived in the past. She knew my reason for not telling her about it. If it were successful, then there was no way anyone could say that I had influenced her because she was totally in the dark about what I was looking for. We had done this before, so it did not bother her. She was agreeable and said, That's okay, but will you tell me about it when I wake up? I laughed and said that I surely would. After I used her keyword and watched as she slipped into a deep somnambulistic trance, I asked her to go back to a time when she was in between lives, in the so-called dead state. I have found that much more information can be obtained when people are in that state because they are not directly involved with the life. When someone is living a life, their perception is narrowed and the physical environment is usually all they are aware of. They cannot supply any information that does not pertain to the life they are living. After they die, the veil, so to speak, seems to be ripped away and they have access to greater knowledge. Often remarkably so. There will be more information about this amazing state in my book, Conversation with the Spirit. Brenda had already proven to have a great capacity for finding this knowledge for me when I had directed her to go to this state. I didn't know how to proceed, but I thought this would be a good place to start. Once she had removed the shackles of the limiting physical body, when I finished counting, I found her in an unearthly pla earthly place of ethereal beauty. 
I am on one of the higher earths. An earth at a higher vibration. It is very beautiful here. I am sitting beside a crystal clear stream that is tumbling over rocks and crystals and gems. The colors are a lot brighter and more vivid than on the earth we spend our lives on. The grass is extremely emerald green. I'm under an oak tree and nearby there is a waterfall. And one of the unusual things about this waterfall is it is also a natural formation of crystal wind chimes. Some of them chime together like wind chimes do and some of them act like a wind harp or wind whistles. There's all sorts of music from them and the waterfall. It's an extremely lovely plain. It's one of my favorite places to come. It did indeed sound like a very beautiful and peaceful place. I wondered if she would mind helping me or if she was busy. I'm busy listening to the wind chimes, but I'm by myself. I mean, you're not involved with anything that I would take you away from if I asked you some questions. No, I don't think so. In case I have to change location to find an answer to a question, I can always come back here afterward. It's a special place to me. Alright. What I would like to do is present you with a problem and see if you can help me with it in some way. As long as it's not math. No, not math. I don't like math either. It's a problem that I have been presented with. A situation type problem. Maybe you can help me. I'll see what I can see. You are aware that I work with this method with many different people to get information. What method do you mean? It's a method I use that allows me to speak to you in these different states. I obtain information from many different people in this way. Yes, you have found a gateway. Well, this is the problem. I was working with a young woman who in a past life was a student of the great master Nostradamus, Miguel de Notre Dame. We call him Nostradamus in our time, but do you know who I mean? Yes, you use the Latin version of his name. He's a very developed soul. In that life, he had a very difficult path to walk. He was the most talented and gifted, gifted of psychic abilities on that level ever. He had so much psychic ability that he was just ripping with it. In other ages, he would have been deified as a god. In his time, he was also misunderstood in a lot of ways. While I was working with this young woman who was giving me information of her life as one of his students, and while we were doing this, Nostradamus spoke to the student. He did not speak to me directly, but he said that it was very important to translate his quatrains, his prophecies. He said they have much meaning to the time period that I'm living in now. He was very emphatic that I do this work. I understand the situation. He was giving me a great deal of information about the quatrains, and then the person I was working with moved away. Before she left, Nostradamus said he would contact me through someone else so we could continue our work. And I wondered if I gave you the instructions he gave me. Would it be possible for you to contact him? From what I can see, it appears there might be a way. In addition to having psychic abilities, he also called upon his guides from this side of things. And during the time that he's calling upon his guides, I think I might be able to go and present myself and see what happens. As a friend, not as a guide. Just as a friend, to help communicate with them. I could present myself as a gateway through a dimension in time. I began to get excited. She sounded so confident. Would this possibly be the way to reestablish contact with him? I hardly dared hope it would work, be so easy. I wanted a vehicle that he could use to continue the work we were doing on the translations. He said it was easier with the other woman. She had a connection with him Excuse me, guys, because of being a student of his at one time. Yes, that would make it easier. Did he specify the vehicle he wanted, or did he leave it up to your discretion? He had mentioned that the music student that I was working with, 
Even though he said Brian, I believe you really meant Brenda. I was going to assume that anyway for the sake of this experiment. Well, he did specify this vehicle. He said he would try to come through her in the same way that he came through the other person. That is good that he specified this one. Then he must feel that there is a sympathetic vibration that will assist with the communication. I could tell you the directions he gave me to contact him. Sorry guys. I don't know if we need the other person, the student or not. Brenda, it does not appear so. From what I can see, it appears that he is prepared to speak to me like he does to his other spirit guides. And for me to either relay it or to speak as though he were speaking directly as if I were not in between, which generally works out best. That's fucking crazy. I impressed on her the importance that he had stressed in revealing the information to our time. The sense of urgency he conveyed about getting this work done, she said she understood. No. I would love to fucking try this with somebody, right? To literally, you know, do what Dolores Cannon has done here. You know, and it's not a seance, it's not spiritism or anything like that, you know, but having the ability through hypnosis and this regression to take somebody into this in-between consciousness place, right? And literally, uh, you know, communicate with somebody that has existed in another time existed in the past. <sighs> Get the yawns, guys. Sorry. We met him in a place that he called a special meeting place. I don't know if you know where that is, Brenda. I think he's referring to a certain dimension that he can reach. I believe so, because when he described it, it was not on Earth. And he was able to stay there for only a limited period of time to converse with me. This is true. He does this. He'll go to this meeting place when he's conversing with his guides. And should I give you the instructions or will I need to count you there? Which will be easier. Afterward, you can always return to your beautiful place. Yes, I can return to this place at another time. This is a fascinating situation. Zero me in on a year or so I'll know when. When he lived? Yes, where I am. Time doesn't mean anything and I can view his whole life and afterward and before like a moving panorama. I'm not sure of the exact years, but I believe he lived in the 1500s. All right. Give me a moment to focus in on him so that I can get the message across to him. I know this would be difficult to do with an ordinary human being, but he was not ordinary. No, he is not ordinary at all, so it can be done. But this being the first time, it might take a little bit longer. It might help if I describe what I see as I zero in. Alright, maybe we can go back to the same time or situation when he was speaking to me before or close enough to it where he would remember the connection. I was really getting excited. Would she be able to locate him and contact him? The odds were so tremendously high against it that any rational person would have said it couldn't be done. But succeed or fail, it was well worth the attempt and I was almost holding my breath in anticipa anticipation. This is pretty wild to think, you know, this woman is actually going to be successful. Brenda, I'm zeroing on Earth, and I'm over Europe now, and there's France. I'm getting closer. Do you know where in France he was? I'm not really sure of the name of the city. His name is Miguel de Notre Dame. Okay, I see him at his place. There is a house where he does his work. The house is made out of stone. According to the standards of the time, it's comfortably large, but according to your standards, it would be a little bit small. Everything is relative. There is a special room where he liked to do his work. In this room, he has various instruments set up, and I see he has come in, and he has lit a flame. He's burning alcohol so that the flame is blue. 
and he's setting up various instruments to help him concentrate on the higher spheres. Is this what helps him to see his visions? Yes. Somehow it helps him with these various instruments of measurement. It helps him to get in tune with the higher vibrations of the universe, which are very precise mathematically. He's able to tune in on these much like a tuning in a radio. And from there he can see many things, or he can astrally travel to other dimensions for a period of time. He is a very unusual man. What type of instruments do you see? He has some writing instruments, and he has... hard to describe. I can see them, but I don't know what they're called. Pointers that are connected at an angle, like you're measuring distances on a map. And he has some calipers, and he has crystals of various sorts on hand as well. I think the crystals are for focusing the light in particular ways to come up with certain vibrations of light. Do you think he uses them to stare at or what? He doesn't stare at the crystals. He focuses the crystals to get a particular vibration or rather a particular color of light. And he meditates on this to encourage a certain frame of mind. And you don't know what the calipers or the measuring instruments are for? No, I'm not sure unless it's for trying to diagram what he sees and wants to do it accurately. Do you see anything else? Well, the whole room is pretty, pretty well cluttered up with things. There's parchments and manuscripts all over and writing instruments and there's a table with things on it and he's writing at a desk or rather there's a writing desk nearby and there's a few books sitting around. The description of the room and house sounded very similar to the other given by Dionysus. I asked for a description of Nostradamus. He's a very distinguished looking man. He's of average height for the time. He has a higher forehead, but he has a very fine featured face. Piercing gray eyes are blue. They're light colored. He's in his early 50s at this point. His hair is gray and he has a full beard and mustache and it flows into the hair and he keeps it clean, which is unusual for this time. He keeps himself well for this time. I think that's partially due to the things he has seen in the future, for I think he has seen the advantage of good hygiene. He's wearing robes, but that is usual. Does he have any prominent features? Very fine featured. His face is proportioned real well. He has straight brows, and his nose is straight, and it's shaped well. His brows kind of shadow his eyes some, and his cheekbones are prominent enough to make them look very deep set. And with them being a silvery gray color, they look very piercing. They just kind of reach out and grab you. I took a quick intake of breath as a tingle of excitement ran through my body. Elena had also mentioned that there was a special quality about the man's eyes. From the description, it appeared that Brenda was seeing the same man in the same setting. But he doesn't look threatening, does he? No, because he's a kind man. Just very piercing and intelligent. What is his occupation when he's not doing these predictions? He's a doctor. He doesn't have any of his medical instruments in the room. I think they're in another part of the house. He does a little bit of everything, but that seems to be the usual pattern for this time. For educated men to be able to do and be conversant with all the major branches of arts and sciences. Did he teach medicine? Do you mean, did he have any apprentices? Yes. Any that he taught medicine to? I don't think so. It doesn't appear to be that way. He has some students who study metaphysics with him. They have to stay there studying medicine because of the Inquisition and such. From these statements, it appeared that the students lived in the house with Nostradamus just as Dionysus had said. There was one student in particular that I was interested in. I don't know if you can see his students there or not. There are no students there at this time. He's working alone. Nostradamus had cures and methods of helping people medically that the doctors at the time could not understand. Do you know anything about that? This is directly related to his psychic abilities. When he would enter another dimension, he was able to see anything and everything that he desired to see. Any field, any subject, and he would be able to see things that he could do with what he had. 
things others had not thought of, but which would be more effective for treating his patients. I've always wondered why he didn't tell the other doctors some of his methods. These were test questions to see if she could come up with the same answers that Elena had. Brenda, the doctors would scoff because these things would go against age-old ways of doing things. If the doctors were open-minded enough to try something, then they would demand to know, well, how did you find that out? Where did you learn it? Did you come, how did you come by this knowledge? Yes, and they would be very suspicious about it. They would say that he was in league with the devil. Everything has an inner suspicion between the church stirring things up, the political unrest, and the various plagues that sweep through from time to time. That was a shame, wasn't it? Because he had much he could have taught them. Yes, indeed. Basically, his talents were wasted at this time. He did the best he could with the time period he was at. I have focused in on another instrument he seems to have. It's not exactly a mirror. It's sort of between. It's sort of a mirror and sort of a cloudy glass. I can't really see what it is. I almost gasped. Could this be the same mirror Elena had mentioned that Nostradamus used to see his visions? The mirror is an archaic instrument, and he knows the art of using it. It's controlled by your mind. I think it's what is referred to as a magic mirror in folklore. The mirror was made in ancient times before the civilization fell. What civilization was she referring to? Atlantis? I wonder how he came by it. I'm not sure. There are various relics like this scattered throughout Europe that are prized and treasured, and each one has a story as to how it got passed down and survived through the centuries. He's fixing to use it, and I think this is how I'm going to be able to contact him through this mirror. Because apparently he'll concentrate on the mirror with the help of the light that he has focused. He concentrates on the mirror and the cloudiness clears. And in the cleared space he'll either see a person that he'll be speaking to or he'll see a path to enter another dimension. Rather like your story through the looking glass. Where the little girl went through the looking glass. He will mentally walk through the looking glass down whatever path he sees. I think when he concentrates and it clears, I will present myself, then speak to him and invite him to walk down the path to you. That is so crazy. So he's using a, a black mirror is what it sounds like he's using, like an obsidian mirror, which um, so many people have demonized me for these kind of things and you know like Nostradamus did these very same things you know it's like would you consider Nostradamus an evil person you know this is probably one of the you know that considered one of the holiest men of, of all fucking time you know and he was using black mirrors you know, this is Solomonic magic right here so and this is what I mean about um, when I was talking at the very beginning of the video about the dogma and shit, this is what it does. It prevents you from having real knowledge. You know, you're told that, oh, if you use a black mirror and, you know, talking to demons and all of that, like, you know, it's satanic and, you know, and it's because people don't understand, you know. That we're actually tapping into our subconscious. Like they're... These entities are a part of us. They're a fragmented part of us. You know, and I truly do believe that. And obviously Nostradamus did too. Which I mean, I'm no Nostradamus. But still, you know, I, I find it very, very comforting that, you know, he would be using, you know, similar things. Candles, mirrors, all that. The last time he and his student both met me there, this would be good if we can do it without the student. There won't be so many people involved. Yes, we go to speak directly. Let me wait on him until he gets into the proper state of concentration. It's difficult for me to focus in, but I think it's because it's the first time. 
I think after we do it once, it'll be much easier when he sees there's a new contact. He'll be happy for that. I know it's very vital. It's like there's a description given of the amount of energy behind the work that you are doing. Multiply that by 10 or 100 times, and that's the amount of energy behind the work he is doing. It must come through, and it must be as accurate as possible. I think it is normal for psychics to try to warn people when they see things that are going to happen. Yes, because he's so... I seem to be picking up on some of his thoughts. Perhaps this will assist in our communication. The main thing he's concerned about is that in spite of his warnings, the people make the wrong choices anyway and walk the very path that he is forcing. He's trying to get the news to people in enough time so that they can perhaps change their minds about some things and avert the worst of it. There were many things he saw that I don't think he understood. I've tried to get them through to me and it's difficult because his quatrains, something, I can't read that, they had to be obscure. They had to be. I get the feeling that's what he wants to do, to give an uh, explanation to go along with the quatrains. Ah, he's at the proper point now, I believe. Let me try to contact him. I will try to report on what happens. He sees me now. She addressed him respectfully. Mikel de Notre Dame, I am the one sent to contact you. I have been asked to be the communicator with the one that has contacted you on the other side of time. Pause. Yes, I am the one. I was asked to repeat to you to meet us at the special meeting place so that we may ensure the interpretation of your quatrains into plain language so that all of us may be warned in time. Well, we can either try to get started or at least set up our line of communication so that it will work out well. Are you prepared to go to that special place, Mikel de Notre Dame? All right, we will wait for you there. My excitement could hardly contain itself. Could it really be possible it actually appeared that we had made contact with him? Did he understand you? Yes, apparently this communication is in the mind and it's of concepts rather than with spoken language. So it doesn't matter what language you think in. It's the basic concepts that goes across and are interpreted into whatever language his conscious mind thinks in and vice versa. Did he remember what you spoke of? Yes, although his facial expression did not change, his eyes became very fiery. I could tell he is excited and he remembered. He said he had been waiting to be contacted and he was wondering when and how we were going to contact him. I felt giddy. I could hardly keep from laughing out loud from pure joy. I thought we had lost contact with him and it worried me that we would not be able to reestablish it. I really thought it would be more difficult, if not outright impossible. Now, I'm going to go ahead, because of time here, and move to the Antichrist emerges and try to get a little bit of this. These are some more bits and pieces of the puzzle of the Antichrist and his ambitions to take over the world. They may help us to understand Nostradamus's lengthy predictions of the coming time of troubles. Now, some of these uh, prophecies you guys will actually probably be familiar with from my channel and other people's channels, you know, that, um, you know, have gotten into prophecy and stuff like that. This one in particular. The Arab Prince, Mars, the Sun, Venus, and Leo, the rule of the church will succumb to the sea. Towards Persia, very nearly, a million men will invade Egypt and Byzantium, the true serpent. Brenda. He says we should not find it surprising that this refers to trouble in the Middle East. The leaders will have different motivations. And I, I did a video about this a year, a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh... It had to do with like Iran and it was actually uh, astrological alignment that 
So we'll see what this says. The leaders will have different motivations in how they're involved with this conflict. One leader is egotistical and wants to be in the limelight, which was Trump. The other leader has mixed feelings about it. He is a fanatic, so he's fanatical about his country. But the fanaticism borders on love and hate. Sometimes when this leader comes to his senses, he realizes that he's obsessed, but there's nothing he can do about it. These two leaders will be conspiring together to upset the balance of world power. He says they will break forth from the boundaries of their countries and overtake other parts of the territory in a very quick and brilliant maneuver. That's why he mentions Egypt and Byzantium, because each leader will expand in a separate direction, yet they will be allied together. When he mentions Byzantium, he refers to Turkey, Istanbul, Constantinople, it was built on the site of this ancient city. It became increasingly apparent that when he had mentioned a place and his quatrains, he was often not referring to that city per se, but to the country in which it was located. They have translated Mars, Sun, Venus, and Leo as astrological conjunctions, and they have tried to pinpoint a date by doing that. He used these astrological signs to be able to give thumbnail personality sketches of the leaders involved in just one or two words. If one knows the horological and astrological associations and traits of these various planets and signs, then it gives you an idea as to the personality types of the various leaders. Hmm. So, according to this, it wasn't, um, which I find to be interesting, um, it wasn't an astrological alignment per se, but he was talking about the astrological personality of the leaders. So maybe this is something that has not even happened yet then. The other portion of this quatrain is interpreted in chapter 16, the ravage of the church. The speeches of Lake Liman will become anger. The days will drag out into weeks, then months, then years, then all will fail. The authorities will condemn their useless powers. He says that this quatrain refers to one of the reasons behind the breakdown in diplomatic relations and communications that will be taking place throughout Europe during the time of troubles. Leaders will get together to meet about important things and make decisions. They won't be able to begin because they will be arguing over minor things, like what shape of table they should meet around, or who should sit at the head of the table, and things such as this, until the whole scheme falls through. They end up not being able to discuss any of the major things they meant to discuss because of all the quibbling over minor, minor details. They think Lake Leman refers to the League of Nations, or Geneva. He says Lake Leman refers to a major lake in Switzerland, near where they will meet. So, Geneva, probably. Then when the eclipse of the sun will be in broad daylight, the monster will be seen. It will be interpreted quite differently. They will not care about expense. None will have provided for it. Now this is fucking wild because here in April, guys, we're getting ready to get the second half of that eclipse that, that, eclipse that we experienced back in what? Was it August 21st? 2017 August 21st 2017 where it was like dark at midday um, made a giant X over the United States pull it up to show it to you yeah August 21st 2017 there it is boom you guys see how this way, going one way across. Let's see if we can see the second half. And boom. And this is the one we're getting ready to experience. Total solar eclipse. Making 
a giant X over the United States. So we're getting ready to experience, you know, this this darkness once again. You know, and uh, interesting. Actually, uh, it's going to be dark where I live. So interesting. So yeah, that's that could be what he's actually talking about or describing. So how about that? Then when the eclipse of the sun will be in broad daylight, the monster will be seen. It will be interpreted quite differently. They will not care about expense. None will have provi provided for it. He says this quatrain refers to the appearance of the Antichrist in the international arena. For many years, the Antichrist will be working silently behind the scenes, consolidating his power. But the structure he has built will not be visible until an event takes place that temporarily dims the apparent power of the major nations. It is believed to be a temporary setback in the image these nations have projected for many years. People will see that something else has taken place as well. The Antichrist and his organization will be sparing no expense to help the organization grow and gain more power. The people they will be moving against will not be prepared for this, for they won't know about this particular threat. The translators interpret this to mean that something will happen during an eclipse of the sun. He says he was using that metaphorically. It appears there will be an eclipse of the sun at a crucial moment, but he was not specifically referring to that. Because of French discord and negligence, an opening shall be given to the Mohammedans, and the land of the Sea of Siena will be soaked in blood, and the port of Marseille is covered with ships and sails. He corrected my pronunciation of the names. He says this quatrain refers to the events that most part have taken place in the past, including the occupation of France and North African campaign of the Axis of Powers during World War II. He says a similar pattern of events will also take place during the time of the Antichrist. The negligence of the NATO powers will be one of the things that will help the Antichrist to take over Europe. I think he said before that they wouldn't realize what's going on until too late. In Toulouse, not far from Belluzer, making a deep pit in a palace of spectacle, the treasure found will come to vex everyone in two and near the Basili. He says the quatrain refers to events that will happen during the time of the Antichrist. The place names given the location in France know Belluzer and Toulouse. The great pit will be caused by the accidental de detonation of some buried weapon or some concealed weapons. The event will cause the people in charge to be ridiculed. The palace of spectacle is an analogy to their positions no longer being held in respect. They are a source of ridicule for they made a very poor decision and bad judgment. Some information will come to light concerning corruption in high places. This will cause consternation. Not only in France, but in another nation as well, for it will be information concerning some diplomatic goings on. The information is symbolized by the treasure found. This will come to light at a bad time and will alarm the parties involved. That's what is meant by the treasure found will come to vex everyone in two places near the bas basicle. I don't know what that basically. The dictionary defines a basically as a seesaw or similarly balanced apparatus. It's a drawbridge. He must be insinuating that something with this symbolism. The ones in France are those who will make a poor judgment concerning the weapons being concealed there. It will cause vexation in the capital. They think it's an anagram, the Belliazer. He says it's a village in his time, a rather rural spot. He named that spot, although he knew the name would change, or perhaps the village would no longer be there. The weapons involved would be concealed in a rural area where there would be less chances of someone discovering them. Did he give the name of the rural village to symbolize the weapons being buried? No, it's not a symbol, it's a location. The weapons will be buried near that rural village but its name will have been changed to the centuries or perhaps most of the people will have moved away so that it might not even be called a village. 
the French fleet, with the great support of the main guard of great Neptune and his trident warriors, province grounds to sustain this great band, moreover fighting at Narbonne with javelins and arrows. He says this refers to the Antichrist European campaign. Ships will land, and the forces will begin going inland, taking the land under their power. He says it will be like a horde of locusts going across the land because they will be stripping it of food to support the army and make it difficult for the local people. When he talks about javelin and arrows, uh, he doesn't really mean those, does he? No, he was just referring to the fighting. He says instead of javelins and arrows, it will be bullets and spear-like devices shot by guns. But he could be referring to mortar, mortar shells. But he says there will be new weapons that you have been developed behind the scenes that this vehicle and you would not yet know about because they still have not yet been exposed to the public. France shall be accused of neglect by her five partners. Tunis, Algiers, stirred up by the Persians. Leon, Seville, and Barcelona having failed, they will not have the fleet because of the Venetians. He says this quatrain has a double meaning. Uh, let's see if we can go. Here we go. seven children left in hostage. The third will come to slaughter his child. Two will be pierced by a hook because of his son. He will come to strike against Genoa and Florence. He says this quatrain describes the downfall of the United Nations during the time of troubles. Someone coming to kill someone else represents the backstabbing that will recur as a result of the collapse of the central form of debate. It says two will be pierced by a hook because of his son. When things return to order and people begin figuring out who did what, there will be a lot of political assassinations taking place. But instead of killing the leaders, some of the countries will occasionally choose to do something to one of the followers or their children to get the results they desire. That sounds kind of drastic too. It will be a very unreasonable time. It will happen toward the end of time of troubles. Then it says he will come to strike against Genoa and Florence. That describes destruction of cultural centers. He'll be striking against places like that or trying to reduce them to rubble. On the mountain of Saint Bell and Arbacel will be hidden beyond the proud people of Grenoble. Beyond Lyons and Bien, there will be such great hail, locust on the land, not a third of it will remain. He says this quatrain describes the side effects of the war of the Antichrist wages on the European continent. The people will hide in underground chambers or in tunnels in the mountains for protection from destruction that will rain down from the skies. There will be great destruction and plagues upon the land as is portrayed in the quatrain. He says it's at this time that men will turn cannibalistic because they will not be able to get the wheat that will still be growing copiously on the American continent. Wow. They say that one of the words lamb means locust. He says that locust is the correct interpretation. So, wow. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to wrap this one up here. Uh, I've been going for quite a while. So, uh, yeah, this has just been really interesting to me, honestly. Um, like darts or arrows. Yeah, it, it is interesting, you know. Um, thinking about just the ability, you know, through the, the hypnosis and how just how amazing our uh, subconscious is, you know, and you know, Mikhail Notre Dame using the black mirror. I wonder. I halfway wonder, like, if uh, Dolores Cannon 
was experimenting with any of the black beer or stuff or anything like that. You know, I'm not saying she has or whatever, but it would be interesting to, you know. And like I said, there's no telling what part of, you know, this was even, you know, was this truly Notre Dame, you know, no, Nostradamus speaking or, you know, a demon mimicking him or, you know, like, and who was the they that was guiding this? Like, it's all so fascinating. It's all so interesting. So we're definitely going to have to do another part to this. Get more in depth to this. I'm starting to run out of gas. It's getting late. I'm getting tired. So I'm going to wrap this one up. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this video tonight. I really enjoyed you guys. Um, like I said, uh, we're going into March. Um, I'm going to go as hard as I can in the month of March. I shit you not. I am bringing the best material I have. Um, not just tarot, but these videos, all of it. Um, so I'm asking everybody to support me. Support me, support me. If you can't support me financially, make sure to just hit the thumbs up. Like, um, follow me. Facebook, Instagram, Best Damn Podcast, Twitter, The Real Best Damn, join my Discord, uh, share my videos, comment, that all helps with the algorithms, like, support me, you know, and if you are able to financially support, um, I, I'm viewer powered, I've been demonetized everywhere, you know, and it's really like it's so costly for me to do like the multi streaming and the software and everything with no help literally so that's like a big reason you know why I don't know if I can continue to, to keep doing it without support so uh, everyone please donate support um, if you do it now I'll count it for the month of March and you'll get access you know for uh, all of March and the, the private videos patreon videos all that good stuff um, all of March, we're going to do uh, discounted tarot readings, all of it. I'm just, I'm going to try to just get as many people involved as possible. It's paypal.me slash the best damn podcast. I'm going to go ahead and sign off over on Twitter. Um, uh, Cash app, best damn podcast. Facebook.com, John Keen, best damn podcast. And uh, over on Patreon, best damn podcast official. And um, make sure to share, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff, guys. Like I said, donate support. I greatly appreciate everybody who does give. And um, if you have given, then you get access to the private playlist and all the uncensored content. And then you just text 513-393-2396 or email the real best damn podcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to book a personal tarot reading, they're 35 bucks right now. They're usually 50 um and same thing text that number email me uh you know i'm pretty good at the tarot readings uh you know if i don't say so myself so you know if you want you really want to see what's going on in your life it's, it's really cool to like look at the energy you know if some people think it's demonic satanic you probably shouldn't watch me if you're one of those people i just wouldn't go ahead and put that out there I, matter of fact i don't want you to watch me if you're one of those dogmatic people, please just leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> get off my pages, get out of my comments, take your weird ass somewhere else and go, you know, go go watch a fucking infomercial or something because I'm I'm not like that. I'm I'm an individual. I am Nostradamus use black mirrors, I do too. And I don't give a fuck who likes it. You can call me a Satanist, you can call me whatever you want. I don't give a fuck. You know? Like, I'm, I'm done with the new age nonsense. I don't care about that shit anymore. Like, that is not what I'm about. That is not what this community is going to be about. So sorry, you know. And we've always been the outcast, you know. Like, that's what kind of made us cool. You know, it was like the fact like we weren't accepted into all the other groups. So I'm not going to switch that up for nothing. Like... You know, I've got some cool guests coming up. Uh, Chaos Magicians, Luciferians, all kinds of fucking wild shit. Um, we'll be doing Satanic Ritual Abuse video next. Uh, so I've got some cool stuff. So stick with me, man. Support me, share, like, subscribe, donate. Join us on Patreon. All right, guys. 
I love you, and I'll see you next time. Y'all have an awesome, awesome weekend. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Kimberly. I appreciate you for all that you do. Everybody, Kimberly's a great moderator. Seriously. I love all of you guys, and I'll see you next time. Peace.